It's very nice to be here. Uh, it's my first real visit to, to uh, Quebec and to the city, and I've really enjoyed it. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our work on um, multi-scale modeling and how we try to fold in uh, different kinds of data, uh, so neural recordings being used in the very broad sense of any kind of data that pertains to neuronal function. So let me just start with a, you know, a, a glimpse of how I think about models. Now, we have models which can be word models, so here's a very influential word model that, uh, not, uh, that coincidentally actually originated around here. Uh, Donald Hebb's uh, model of, uh, that has driven a lot of uh, investigation into plasticity. But this is a word model. This explains what will happen. It doesn't do so in a mathematical sense. It does not do so in a mechanistic sense, though it gives some indications about where to look for these things. Uh, here's a different kind of model. This is actually quite a powerful kind of model. This, this model has, be, has actually very accurate uh, predictions about uh, things, but clearly it's it's not uh, has in, nothing at all in common with the mechanisms that uh, the real system uh, obeys. Uh, here's a kind of model that we've seen uh, at different points in this uh, in this uh, uh, meeting, uh, different levels of abstraction of neuronal function. So here's a, a very co uh, simple rate model for how uh, neuronal computation might uh, take place, and this is commonly used in large. Uh, neural network simulations. It's used a lot in the uh, AI machine learning uh, kind of domain, uh, but we're not going to go there. And then we're starting to come a little bit closer to home. There's different kinds of models which use various abstractions of the biophysics. Um, so here's an integrate and fire model. Now, uh, the way I like to broach the topic to uh, my, my students is to say that, you know, there's a whole range of uh, of basic biophysical, biochemical principles um, on which you can account for a huge swath of neuronal function. And this relatively small set of equations, uh, ranging from chemistry, diffusion, Nernst potential cable equation, Hodgkin Huxley stuff, synaptic stuff, this relatively small set of equations actually is an excellent foundation for a, a huge range of models and uh, is in fact the basis for some of the uh, work I'll be telling you about. And you've heard about, uh, you know, many of the kinds of models you've heard about fall within the ambit of this uh, set of equations. Now, this is the sort of the recurring question uh, that uh, modelers have to uh, address, which is how much de detail do you put in and wh why does it matter? And since I'm going to be delving somewhat deeper into the cellular detail of what goes on, maybe I, I'll spend a couple of moments uh, giving you my perspective on uh, why the detail matters and, uh, and why I think that actually deep worrying about things as fine-grained as molecular function uh, is important. So uh, let's just start with just the computational uh, side of things. If you want to think about how a neuron performs its computation, uh, one aspect of it is something that Yota already brought up, which is that the neuron is not simply a ball that gets inputs from different places and sums up the, the uh, respective inputs. It's doing a huge amount of computation along the way. The dendrites are, uh, in fact, a very effective parallel computation mechanism, and you can abstract it as uh, like a multilayer neural network, as, as uh, she has done, or you can abstract it as I will be telling you about, is uh, different domains doing actually quite sophisticated computations ranging from uh, information storage to pattern selectivity. So that's the P here, the parallelism. Next one, uh, which I think is, is to me one of the most exciting bits, is that when you start to look more closely at what's going on in a, in a detailed neuron, in a detailed neuronal model, you, you get to see phenomena whose properties are very, very different from just the sum of the parts. And this is the, the interesting nonlinearities that come out, uh, properties of, uh, of uh, multi-stability, um, and so on. So these are emergent properties, if you like. It's a much abused term. But these are properties which make the neuron do much more interesting things than simply add up a whole lot of inputs. Um, another thing which I've, 
I've sort of grown to appreciate as, as, uh, you know, as, as I've done these models over the years is that remarkably often when you uh, look at the details that underlie neuronal function, when you look at the, the various channels that are there, when you look at the signaling pathways, it seems to be that nature has put in uh, a lot of perhaps redundancy, a lot of ways of ensuring that the system works even if the conditions are not quite right. And this sort of appears, this, this sort of just happens when you put in more detail. To put it in other terms, I have, you can make abstract models that will do what you want, perhaps, but will only do so in a very narrow range of parameters. And I've found very, more often than not that going into a very detailed model means that the system behaves correctly, in other words, it, does the, it, ha it exhibits the properties that uh, you're interested in over a much wider range of conditions. And this, I think, think is, is interesting and perhaps uh, a natural outcome of the fact that neurons, biological systems in general, have to work over a very wide range. And so when you go into the biological details, you're likely to see some of those properties emerge. Another thing which is important is that very frequently, when you look at an abstract model or any model, you do so in a very, very specific context. So in other words, it will work for one set of conditions, but you change the conditions, you change the problem a little bit, and it might not do what you hoped it would do. Um, to put it in other terms, a real cell and real neuron has, has to worry about not just uh, integrating, say, synaptic input, it has to worry about neuromodulators. It has to worry about the fact that it may, be suscept it may be affected by, uh, you know, pathogens. It might be, it might, it might uh, undergo some kind of damage. And yet, it has to continue to continue to perform a function which may be somewhat modified by these additional inputs, but it still has to give a reasonable output. So, real neurons are operating in a more complicated context than simple abstract models. And finally, there's the the much neglected and I think much underappreciated aspect of homeostasis or housekeeping, which is just keeping the shop going, keeping the neuron alive, keeping the ATP, the channels alive, keeping the iron gradients there is non-trivial. It's non-trivial in the extreme. And I think there's a lot of very interesting uh, essential stuff going on at this level of computation. And this is just, so this set of things, PER, PERCH, um, these, these five points are purely from the computational viewpoint, and if one wants to look at other kinds of domains, such as disease or damage to the, to the, to the brain or to development, uh, looking at these additional details, especially the molecular level ones, becomes very, 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 very important. So this is why I'm uh, so interested in what's going on in great detail, as I'll be telling you about. Okay, so this is my, my flame bait slide. Um, uh, this is uh, my back of the envelope calculation, uh, which says that actually what most people observe through electrical recordings is a small, a very small error term on what the neuron is actually doing by way of computation. And the argument goes like this, that uh, electrical computations in the brain happen fast, they operate say on the time scale of one millisecond, but electricity propagates actually quite a long distance, the length constant is quite long say about half a millimeter. Chemical computations, on the other hand, are relatively slow, though of course bear in mind that synaptic transmission is primarily chemical. But even, even leaving that out, outside the, our present discussion, uh, chemical stuff is slow, but the length scale is so short because diffusion is, is limited that you, more than, that you compensate for the slow uh, chemical calculations by having a lot of calculations going on in parallel. So you could basically say that every spine is performing its own computations in parallel. So now, in addition to all of this, or to multiply all of this, there's the fact that when it comes to electricity, there's one signal. It's the potential or the current, you know, which are, which are uh, flip sides of the same coin. Whereas in chemical signaling, you have hundreds of different pathways. And so you put all of these things together, and so in principle, the amount of computation you can do chemically is far more than you can do electrically speaking. Now, anyway, so this is, this is a bit of flame bait, and we can have some fun discussions on it later on. But again, it motivates some of, some of the analyses and approaches that I'll be telling you about. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll start out uh, talking about the modeling framework that we use. 
I'll discuss some of the data framework, and uh, Sharon gave a very nice uh, overview of the importance of such frameworks. And then I'll just give you some glimpse of, glimpses of what we're planning to do with, this, uh, with these uh, capabilities. So our modeling framework is MOOSE, uh, which stands, I, I think I actually forgot to put in the, the acronym. It stands for Multiscale Object Oriented Simulation Environment, for those of you who are wondering. Um, here it is. Oh, I've actually got it up there. And it's open source, GPL, all the rest of it. You can download it. You can play with it. You can, you can make your computer overheat uh, uh, very, very, ni very nicely with all of this. And the key point of Moose is that it was designed from the outset to be able to do multi-scale computations. That is, calculations ranging from literally molecular, single molecule level events all the way up to large networks. Um, there are two particular domains that uh, we've been playing with uh, in, in recent years. One is the multi-scale domain ranging from a uh, few molecules uh, doing chemical computations embedded in their natural setting, that is in the neuron, in the single cell. So these uh, calculations, which I'll tell you about a bit more, use a framework called R Designer, And this, uh, this basically is aimed at describing what single neurons can do computationally, including all of the chemical uh, events. And then we also have uh, a bunch of network computations that we can do, um, which are, which, and you've seen a lot of, of those, those kinds of multi-scale uh, computations. For example, Ivan gave this uh, marvelous talk about uh, using really, really detailed models, even at the single cell level, and then embedding them in a large network. So these are all things that one can do with, uh, with Moose. So uh, just to remind you the, the kinds of calculations one does, um, you can use your standard electrical uh, ingredients, um, which are uh, a cell morphology, a bunch of ion channels. You can define these things using NeuroML. Uh, you can define them using some legacy formats like the Genesis.p format. You can define the morphology using uh, the SWC format from Neuromorpho. These are all things that the system can take in. It builds up your standard uh, cable equation representation, which is implemented as a bunch of compartments. And this is solved using one of our numerical engines, which we call the H-Solve, in honor of Mike Hines, H for Hines. And this can do partitioning, of course, from in, in, in a very wide range of, uh, of levels of detail. The chemical side is actually very, you know, very reminiscent of the electrical side of things. We can import uh, a bunch of uh, uh, definition formats for uh, chemical systems. Um, what, what we define is a set of reaction diffusion system. And much like uh, compartmental modeling in the electrical domain, you, the way you do these calculations is you subdivide the cell. You have to subdivide it more finely because the length constant, as I said, for diffusion is quite small. And so you may have to do more, far more subdivisions of the cell uh, in order to accurately describe the uh, chemical reactions, uh, diffusion going back and forth. And then you have some set of reactions which are solved using uh, differential equations. And you can partition this in various ways. And we have two numerical engines for doing this, which work in tandem. One is for doing the chemical kinetics. That's the K-solve. And the other one is for doing diffusion stuff. That's called D-solve. And, and these can do fairly large uh, reaction diffusion systems. Um, subdividing the cell into 30,000 or so uh, little pieces. Uh, each one of those pieces may, just so that you're aware of what it takes, may have a lot of reactions in it. And this is a small subset of the kinds of reactions that uh, one worries about in synaptic functioning, for example. This is just a bunch of synaptic uh, reactions that we did many, many years ago. And of course, things have gotten worse, if you like, since then. There's a lot more reactions that are now known and that are realized to be important for synaptic function. So uh, we, we put a little bit of extra effort on, on the spines for a number of reasons. Uh, this is something for which, to my knowledge, there is no uh, standard uh, to define what spines do and how they, how they should uh, compute. So, but we have a specification within the R designer framework, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But spines do a lot of very interesting things. I mean, for one, they house a lot of reactions, of course, and they, of course, house the synapses, they house the, the NMDA receptors, and so on. Uh, but spines are not static structures. I mean, for that matter, nor, nor are neuronal morphologies, but spines are really very dynamic. And when you have spines changing their size and shape, that does a lot of strange things to the possible 
physiology to the possible computations. For example, a spine gets bigger. Um, assuming that the receptor density is the same, the total receptor conductance is going to be become larger. Assuming that the number of uh, molecules in there is the same, those are going to get diluted out. Assuming that the cell membrane properties are the same, the passive properties are going to change all over the place. And something else happens, which is also actually quite a complication, which is that when the spine geometry changes, the diffusive uh, access that the spine has to the dendrite, that changes dramatically. And all of these are the outcome, all of these changes are the outcome of some chemical event that caused a spine change in the first place. So you have this, you have all these interesting loops of scales of events happening from the chemical, electrical, and morphology. And you have to fold these all together when, uh, especially in the case of modeling spines. There's some interesting side notes here. For example, it's, it may be a bit surprising, non it was non-intuitive non to me, that it's actually faster to do the stochastic calculations for chemistry when you're doing it in the volume of a spine than it is to do standard deterministic calculations. So your ODEs take longer to run than your stochastic uh, 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 Gillespie algorithm kind of calculations, which is kind of nice because when you're talking about volumes of a spine, you need to worry about chemical noise, and that's what the, uh, the stochastic methods give you. And so again, you have to deal with tens of thousands of spines in some very detailed models. Okay, so, and this is the kind of stuff that lives in every single one of those spines and that we need to uh, crunch through. So uh, let me just change a little bit uh, to how we do, how we set these things up. So we've de devised something called R Designer, and I should really have broken up that acronym. It stands for Reaction Diffusion and Electrical Signaling in Neurons. That's what the R Designer is. And what it can do is listed over here and sort of schematized over here. But basically you can define the somatic excitability, you can define molecular transport along the dendrites, uh, dendritic excitability, you can insert spines in whatever positioning and spacing you like, uh, you can address matters of spine structural change, you can define protein synthesis and turnover, synaptic input of course, uh, and deal with uh, diffusion and, and uh, chemical signaling all over the cell. So let me give you a, a, a simple example of what you can do with our designer. So here's a, a little system where you have a cell which is excitable. Uh, it has a couple of uh, spines on it which have some reactions in it. They have synaptic input coming to glutamate and NMDA receptors. And then there's some reaction diffusion signaling happening in the, in the dendrite. And here's the chemical system. Some bits of it are in the dendrite. That's just the calcium diffusing. Some bits of it are in the spine head and some, of, some bits of it are in the postsynaptic density. So this is a, you know, a neat little system. And what you can do with this is actually kind of cool. This, is, this turns out to be bistable. It's, it's, a, it's a fake system, but it's bistable, which is kind of an interesting property, which, what, by which I mean that uh, it starts, if you're giving it a regular ticking away of uh, synaptic input at one hertz, um, the system will settle down to a certain low value of uh, membrane depolarization. Every time you give a pulse, there's a small, uh, small uptick in the membrane potential. So uh, at 10 seconds, what we're doing here is we're giving it a burst of synaptic input. And what that does is it opens the NMDA channels, calcium floods in, and it kicks off the reaction system you over see over here. And that works its way through to the cam CAM kinase 2. And what the CAM kinase 2 does, it translocates to the postsynaptic density, it phosphorylates, and therefore increases the conductance of your glutamate receptor. That means that every synaptic input causes a greater depolarization, and that means that more calcium will come in for even for the low synaptic rate input. And so there's the phosphorylation happening of the, of the receptor. And basically, to cut a long story short, this flips it, to in, it into a state where the ba baseline synaptic input is enough to keep the thing uh, in a state of high uh, responsiveness. Okay, so this is, uh, it's a toy model in, in some sense because it's obviously somewhat artificial, but I think it illustrates the, the levels of complexity that come up when you are dealing with multi-scale events that include the chemical events, the, the signaling, the electrical events, and it's, you know, it's, it takes one line to change this to also deal with, for example, morphological change. And just to indicate uh, what our designer can do for you, this is the entire definition file for this model. 
Yeah. So there's a few lines here for defining the simulation, specifying, specifying the time steps for display and, and uh, uh, computation. There's a list of prototypes, which include the channel prototypes. Uh, basically, the, the channel kinetics are defined in a NeuroML file somewhere. Um, there's something that defines what the cell geometry is, uh, something that defines what kind of spine we're using, what its dimensions are, what its, what its channels are. Uh, then we have a small section which, which tells us where the spines are on the neuron, where the channels are on the neuron. And you can put in fairly complicated, here I haven't done it, but you can put in fairly complicated distributions depending on uh, position from soma and so on. So that's the distributions part. And then in just these two lines, we're doing the multi-scale bridging. We're going from the chemical to the electrical, that is the, the uh, channel phosphorylation to changing the conductance, and we're going from the electrical to the chemical, that is the ion, uh, calcium ion influx into the calcium concentrations. That just takes a couple of lines, and then we deliver the stimulus, which takes all of one line. We have a bunch of lines for displaying it and running it. So this is the entire definition for this uh, rather interesting uh, loop. And uh, that's not all. Uh, but let me just spend a couple of moments uh, describing what these adapter things are, because these are the core of, the, of mapping between uh, different domains of function. What you have to do when you're uh, mapping from chemical to electrical, for example, is that, as I said, the, the spatial discretization of the chemical system is much finer than it is for the electrical system. So if you want to take, say, a concentration term and use that to modulate a channel conductance term, what you need to do is you need to say, actually, I'm, I'm going to take all of the concentration terms uh, in all of the pixels, all of the voxels that, are, uh, uh, that map onto the one voxel, that, uh, the one segment that was used for the electrical calculation. So it has to do an averaging over a certain uh, length scale. So that's a space averaging. But interestingly, you have to go the other way for doing uh, the averaging in the time domain, which is that you might have some complicated but very fast uh, electrical event, let's say the, the ion influx, that is happening at a much finer time scale than the chemical events are, than the chemical computations are. And so you need to now do the averaging, the summing over the finer time scale and pass that on to the chemical system. So all of this happens behind the scenes and then there's various scaling factors that one can apply, for example, to map the concentration of the channel to a conductance change. And this is all it takes, really, to map from uh, one uh, physical, one uh, domain of, of computation to the other. And that's how we do the, the multiscaling. So just to give you an idea of the kinds of complexity we, we look at, so here's the simple model that you just saw. It has six electrical segments, four ion channels, two kinds of receptors, some 60 chemical voxels, and eight or so reactions. The uh, the more complicated version over here, significantly more complicated version, has got, you know, a, a full neuronal morphology, uh, sub, su su suitably subdivided into lots and lots of uh, spines, um, uh, lots of ion channels, and much more complicated reaction scheme. And the key point is that to do this, to go from one to the other, you need to change three lines. You need to change one line which says this is the uh, morphology. You need to change one more line which says this is the chemical system. And you need to change a line which says that this is how you're going to deliver the stimulus. And that means that this short snippet of, this not snippet, this entire program that defines the, this reaction diffusion, this multi-scale system, can define this, uh, this um, simple model here as well as this complicated model here. And that, I think, is a very nice way of using the modularity of standards. That is, we take some standard definition for morphology, we take some standard definition for chemical systems, and it's up to the, now the, the software to package all of these and make them work together. Um, just, I'm sure this is of interest to some of you, that is the speed uh, question. How long does it take to run these things? Well, uh, the simple model runs significantly faster than real time. Uh, which is nice because very often uh, chemical type experiments such as LTP experiments take half an hour to run. Unfortunately, uh, unless you do parallelization, the big thing runs a lot slower than real time. And it's kind of interesting that the rate limiting thing here is actually the electrical computations because you have to run uh, electrical models at a much finer time step than you have to run chemical ones. So adding the chemistry doesn't actually slow it down that much. 
you can have a really, really complicated chemistry uh, in a model of this size. Okay, so that's just uh, an indication of what you have there. Okay, so that was the modeling framework. And now I'll tell, uh, tell you a little bit about how we uh, parameterize and build, uh, uh, get, the, get the numbers into such a, such a system. So you've already heard about various data frameworks. The Blue Brain project has a very system, had a very systematic way of building up their, their uh, uh, parameters. Uh, you also heard about the Allen uh, Institute's uh, framework for uh, defining specific kinds of, ex of experiments and having them in their database. And so we've also developed uh, a database, and it actually bears some uh, resemblance to something that Sharon talked about. How do you define a set of experiments and map them onto a set of simulations? Uh, so the basic idea is that we have our model. For example, it could be defined in SBML or it could be defined using our designer. We have a stimulus that was used in an experiment. So they put it in a, in a slice in a dish and they zapped it in some way or they poured some chemicals on it. And then you have the expected outcome. You had what actually came out of the experiment. So we define this in, a, in the, what we call the find sim format. And this is uh, basically, it's, at this point, it's simply a, a, a table uh, format which allows us to unambiguously specify all of the inputs that go into, the, into this uh, calculation. And that feeds right into Moose, which does everything that needs to be done. And you'll see a little bit more about that. And that gives you a readout. And then you can compare that with what the experiment actually got. And that gives you a score, and you can do all sorts of things after that. You can optimize it, you can, you can decide whether or not you believe this experiment, and so on. So this is the pipeline that we uh, employ for, uh, for this uh, system. Um, one important design decision that we had to make here was, how do you define what is the model on which you will base everything else? So one way of doing it might have been that you, for each experiment you have a model and you try to find a way subsequently to put them together. We felt that instead we'll have a reference model which has all the pieces in it because the interactions between the pieces are actually also fairly involved. So here's our reference model uh, up here in panel A. And for a given experiment, which might only involve a small subset of pathways, it might be in a test tube and only involve a few molecules, what we do is we uh, sort of trim away the excess and just focus on the parts which we are interested in. So this is, the, this is the rough pathway that we're interested in for this experiment. And just zooming in over here. So we trim away all of the other bits, all the bits there and there. Focus on that. And even within that, there's some bits that we drop out. And then the system cleans up all the loose ends. And it runs the simulation just for that bit, just for that experiment. And then you, and you can specify all the, all the necessary aspects of the experiment. It turns out that it's actually quite, uh, uh, there's a common subset that seems to account for many, many things. You define what kinds of readouts you want. These would be the results. So you could have a dose response curve, some kind of bar chart. You could have an action potential coming out of a current clamp experiment, and so on. And then you uh, run the simulation, uh, get a score out of it. You can do different kinds of fitting. You can use this for optimizing it. And in the end, though, it comes down to scientific judgment to decide how much you trust this experiment, how much weight you want to give it. We have, over the past few months, built up a database of experiments, and this is something that we keep expanding. Um, I think there's some, at this point, there's some 70 different experiments, with, uh, with each of which can constrain the model in different ways, di looking at different pathways. The model at this point, version 0 0.9 something, has got roughly 300 molecules and 200 reactions in it, and it draws on data from many, many sources. So that's the framework in which we are working to uh, get decent models. So let me just end then with what we're hoping to do with all of this. So let me get back to my uh, PERCH uh, acronym here. So P, we've been analyzing parallel computation over the cell. And uh, so here's, the, here's the, our sort of a monster model, which has got all sorts of horrible things in it. It was morphology from neuromorpho, uh, some 5,000 spines, a huge reaction set in each spine, background synaptic input, the works. And uh, this is just a picture of it. Um, all the little blinky lights, which you may or may not be able to see, are synaptic input coming in uh, randomly at background. Except it's not totally random. Somewhere embedded in all these blinky lights are certain sequences of input. 
and the parallelism comes in because the cell is, this is our interpretation, is in parallel able to monitor whether or not there is a sequence of input, uh, a, a sequence of activation coming in in any particular dendrite. You could also argue that the cell is in parallel at every single one of those synapses assessing whether the pattern of inputs is such that it should engage in synaptic plasticity. So that's parallelism. Here's an example of emergence. So this is a very old uh, study that we uh, looked at where the emergent property was that of bistability. So you have a feedback loop, a chemical feedback loop in this case, and that is uh, interesting as a, a switching uh, uh, function. Here's another kind of emergence. We were looking at sequence selectivity. And basically what we find is that with the right chemical system in place, uh, if you follow a synaptic input that comes in successive locations along a dendrite, uh, you get a strong response. But if it comes in a scrambled order, as in this case, so it sort of jumps from there to there, the net result is very small. So here are examples of emergent behavior that is happening at the biochemical and electrical interface and is able to do an interesting computation. Um, we're also using this for some disease models. We're making reference models with, uh, with, uh, to the extent that we can get the data for healthy neurons, and we're comparing them with uh, uh, experiments done in fragile X models, mouse models of, of mutation. And this is a consortium effort, and we're actually very keen to uh, bring in uh, other people who are interested in such efforts. So these are models which look very closely at the chemical signaling events that underlie uh, these, these uh, diseases. Okay, so to summarize, uh, there are very many important problems in uh, neuroscience which require models that actually pay a lot of attention to biological detail. And these typically span many scales, uh, electrical and optical, and you can get data from them from uh, interesting new recording techniques that you heard about in the morning. Uh, you can look at chemical reporters, and you can look at morphological change. These are all inputs that you can give to these, uh, these analyses. And we've developed tools to run these and parameterize these and analyze them, and we're hoping to build up collaborations to work on these. So there we are. This was the framework uh, for modeling, for the data handling and analysis, and what we're planning to do with it. And these are some of the crew who have worked on the project. Thank you. Thank you, Upi. Uh, any questions? Uh, please use the microphones. Yeah. Maybe a stupid question, but is there something that neuron cannot do of the things that you described, like incorporating temporal and spatial scales? I think that's in there, and chemistry as well. So, so why why would I use moose instead of neuron? Um, neuron can, in principle, do some of the chemical stuff, but it would be painful in the extreme. And it, I don't think it at present can do the stochastic calculations, though that may have changed recently. <coughs> I think you can. Yeah, but um, it would not be fun. <laughs> okay. Um, very nice. Uh, yeah. So some of the you, you kept emphasising the chemical aspect was very slow, but obviously there are some very fast chemical reactions. And I, so I was wondering whether things like uh, calcium binding to synaptic tagment, for example, whether you can run uh, your chemical reactions at different rates. Uh, to, to, to take into account the, the, the spectrum of kinetics of the chemical reactions. Mm -hmm. So that happens sort of automatically if you're using the Gillespie algorithm. So if this is happening in the spine, then the, the different rates are partitioned without your having to do any further effort. So are you you're using mostly the stochastic approach? In the spines, that's what we're doing. For the dendrites, the volume is large, and so the Gillespie method really gets bogged down. So there you have to use a deterministic method, and there, you, there one, is, one needs to deal with stiffness of the kind that you're describing. Um, we are currently using a Rangakata method to get very technical, but there are some nice implicit methods where that would address the point that you bring up, where the fast things can be handled cleanly, uh, even, even though there's a lot of most, most of it is happening slowly. Uh, okay, just one related question, which is if you have a low copy number in the spines of the proteins that are interacting. Does that cause any problems with the adapter approach? Um, because doesn't that depend on sort of averaging um, and... 
right. so and well mixed. I, I mean, we can get, get into the technical details, but what we do is we, uh, when we're dealing with any interface between the spine and the dendrite where you're doing stochastic versus deterministic calculations, then you need to do uh, actually a probability-based judgment about whether the, the real value should give you plus one or minus one on the, on the stochastic side and vice versa. So we have, we have worried about that and we've taken it into account. So um, this may be a slightly naive question, but can it um, can your modeling framework um, sort of deal with gene trans transcription sort of level things? So uh, it's easy to implement gene transcription in a molecular framework. It's not very efficient. There's uh, other more efficient ways of doing it, which we haven't yet done. Uh, partly because so yeah, partly because we've not really had the the use case to do so. But of course, there's an enormous amount of transcriptomic data coming yes. out now, which yes. might be you know, yeah. very relevant. Yeah. So I think, I mean, for now, it's it's easily possible to do it in the chemical framework. It's just not the optimal way of doing it. So, uh, so I have a question. Um, so so the, the title of the session is standardization in multi-scale modeling. Um, so I understand that our designer is based on, runs on Moose as, as the back end. But it looks, in principle, it could also be run on Neuron. For example, how, how much work would it be to, if you like, implement our designer for Neuron? I suspect it would be a lot. It was a lot of work for Moose, and Moose was designed to do this sort of thing. Um, in Neuron, the chemical stuff has been added on by Tom Morse and others as a, as a subsequent effort. Um, but uh, I, it could be done. I mean, it's, it's a technical exercise. Um, and I think that what, I think what we got from the our designer exercise was an appreciation of actually how simple it could be to define a really complicated model. That is, we've been able to do it in just a few lines and there's no real reason why it should be, why you need more information to do so. And, you know, this is something which you can probably also define this set of things in NeuroML too. Um, there, that, that does have a fair, fair degree of uh, flexibility. But in all these things, my experience is you first have to have an implementation that shows that it can be done, and then you can figure out how to do it in a clean way. This is, not, this is Python, right? So this is not perhaps the optimal way for defining a model. But it's, uh, it's, it shows you what is needed. Yep. Any more questions? Um, very nice. I, I just have a question about the uh, spine um, granularity. So. Um, we know that many molecules in spines are, for example, either synaptically localized uh, in the membrane or perisynaptically localized, mm -hmm. like mGluR receptors or lipases. Yeah. Um, uh, which actually, is real, that organization is really critical for function. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, can you model that, or do you, do you model that, or do you take right now the spine as one entity? So. We can model that, we don't do it yet. Currently our subdivision is we have the postsynaptic density and we have the spine bulk and then we have the dendrite and of course so many other things and so on. But you know, it's not a, it's not a big step to add uh, additional uh, relevant compartments um, as the need comes up. Okay, could we have the next speaker please? Jason Sheffy, is he here? And we, I, we, if, if there are any more, yeah.